Hello, and welcome to the Argyle HR Leadership Forum. My name is Vicki Lynn Brunskill, and it is great to have everyone joining us today. Just a couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator and our wonderful panelists for this session. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors, the virtual booth at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience today at any time during the event. You can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page. Also, to ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we'll address your questions at the end of the session. And now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Stacey Lewis, Chief Executive Officer, Chief Influencer, and former Chiro of HR Interrupted. We are so excited to have Stacey and our panelists with us for a panel discussion titled Harnessing Hyperpersonalization to Improve Employee Experiences. Welcome, Stacey. Over to you. Thank you, Vicki. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today. We are so honored to have you share this space with us as we talk about harnessing hyper-personalization to improve employee experiences. And so we have a rich and robust conversation for you today with an extraordinary panel. So I want to jump right in and start this conversation. Um, panel, I'm going to ask you a question. Introduce yourself to get this going, because this is going to be an extraordinary conversation. So when I go to you, please introduce yourself. And tell us about the most significant ways in which you have seen organization improve the employee experience with personalization. Because you know we're talking about harnessing hyper-personalization, which takes on an advanced level of technology in looking at how we do the employee experience. So Carrie, I'm going to start with you. Please introduce yourself and tell us the most significant ways that you have seen organizations improve the employee experience through personalization. Thank you so much, Stacey. Carrie Salander, I'm with Ashley Furniture Industries, their HR Senior Director of Employee Experience. I think one of the most interesting things to me on this journey is we've really moved from um, what would be the employee uh, mapping, employee journey mapping, and we've personalized it. So now we're going back and asking the employee instead of maybe putting them in a bucket like we did before, how do you want to be communicated to? What works best for you? Do you like text? Do you like video? Some people still like paper, but what does that look like for you and how can we better serve you in that way? So I really think asking, listening, and then acting on uh, the feedback has really been where we've seen that tweaking to really meet our customer and our employees' needs. Love that, Carrie. We are no longer in the days of making people feel happy to have a job, right? People matter. Love that. Francesca, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Francesca McKibben. I work for Cloud Imperium Games. We're the makers of Star Citizen and Squadron 42. It's a crowdfunded video game. Um, and so your question, Stacey, is uh, about hyper-personalization. Is that right? Your question, I want you to introduce yourself right now and tell us what's the most significant ways that you have seen organizations improve um, their experience. Well, going back to what Carrie said as well, um, it's really going back to the employee. And I think that we've seen a shift um, during the pandemic and post-pandemic. We, we really started to lean closer to employees and get a better understanding of them. We really had to change the framework of how we existed in, in, in today's world. I was talking to Jen about it earlier, how mm -hmm. we no longer do the Monday to Friday um, in person. A lot of different companies do a different model. So we're trying to cater to different types of people. You know, are are you a single mother? Are you a caregiver? Are you a are you a, a parent to someone? Or you know, and and what happens is, those people need also work life balance. It's no longer that you know you have to sit here and and be present and show kind of um, your dedication to to work. Right now, a lot of us are either at, in the studio, right, or at office, or we're at home, right now, and that's kind of part of hyper personalization and really understanding what people need to get the best out of them. Awesome. Thank you, Francesca. Jen, same question. Just introduce yourself and tell what are some of the significant ways that you have seen organizations improve employee experience through personalization? Yes, thanks, Stacey. So, so happy to be here. So first off, I want to thank the folks at Argyle for reaching out and hosting this event. Um, honored to participate. So I am Jen McCloskey. I am Director of Employee Experience for the Payments Operations a group at J.P. Morgan Chase, which is a group of about 9,000 employees um, globally. Been with the company for about 10 years and focused in this capacity for about four and a half years. So the one disclaimer I want to put on this is, although I do HR, like in my role, I do not sit within HR. So it's kind of unique in that, you know, I'm, I'm not an HR specialist, but I play one on TV. 
Um, and so I think when it comes down to personalization, I think what we're seeing is we're getting really good at spotting when companies are just checking a box or phoning it in. So that's where hyper personalization and getting that right is really critical. Um, and I think one of the examples that came to my mind when thinking about this question is, um, you know, we had the opportunity to work with our HR partners. We have the ability in our employee directories to put in preferred name, you know, in addition to pronouns and things like that. And our recognition programs were not using preferred name. So, you know, say, for example, you know, my name is Jennifer, but I prefer to go by Jen. When you recognize me as Jennifer, I don't even like acknowledge that. I'm like, who's this Jennifer person? <laughs> so we worked with our HR partners and, and um, our tech partners to say, you know what, if you're taking the effort to collect something as unique as preferred name, we need to use it. And so that had a huge impact on people being like, oh, okay, recognition is actually acknowledging me and using my preferred name. So I think that's just a great example where, you know, you have to make sure you're using the data at your disposal to get your personalization right. Um, and that really has an impact on employees saying, all right, I took the effort to do that and you're using it. Love so that was kind of the example that came to mind. I love that, Axel, right? You're asking for the data. What do we do with it, right? And that's why sometimes employees don't give data because they think it's just a waste of time. Love that. Exactly. Rocky, high level, introduce yourself and just share with us one significant way in which you've seen organization improve the employee experience through personalization. Sure, sure. Good morning, everyone. So super happy to be here. Um, so I wear two different hats at the moment. Uh, I'm a senior business analyst. Uh, I work at Google at the moment as a senior BA, but I also run an insurance agency. So kind of two different things. So I get a little bit of experience being, you know, having touch with HR on both sides of it, more so on the insurance side of it, since I do have some uh, agents that work with me there. Um, in terms of, you know, personalization, I mean, we're talking really more than just, you know, slapping someone's name on a, on a birthday email. We're talking about like really taking time to understand like, what is that person's experience going to be throughout this entire journey while they're at this organization? So a couple of things that I think I've seen um, Google do a really good job of is just like uh, they do a lot of personalized onboarding. So like, you know, when you're starting a new job, you know, you have an onboarding plan that's kind of like tailored to what you want to accomplish, your skill levels, your interests, maybe get you paired with a mentor who shares a lot of the passions that you have just mm -hmm. uh you know even the modules that we go through it's just all very very tailored to exactly where you are currently in your level of understanding mm -hmm. and then we also have you know google does a really good job of like flexible work arrangements so you know not everybody wants to work in a traditional like nine to five type of office setting so they'll let you work from anywhere pretty much for the most part as long as you can get your work done and even the google office is just there's just so many different things you can do there's like little slides that you can take from like office to office so that's something that's extremely important i think for the personalization aspect of it and also the third component is just like you know career development like you right, know correct. not do making everything like one size fits all but rather like letting each person take their own journey and mm -hmm. so even like the training programs and things like that the mentors opportunities are all catered towards like what that person ultimately wants to accomplish thank you rafi i appreciate that you know Francesca, I want to jump into something that you were talking about, and that is how would you define hyper personalization, right? You all have done such a great job in giving examples about personalization in space, but this is hyper, this is next level. So how would you define that? You touched on it a little bit. And why is this important to today's HR leaders, people strategists, as you guys know, behind uh, HR, I call it people, business, culture, strategists, because that's really what we do. Why is that important? really bring that hyper piece into it for us. Right. Well, to define it, of course, uh, very simply, it's, it's, it's the heart of it is data, right? It's using data analytics and taking this information and really trying to customize to tailor employee experiences to what um, they need from a group to individual level. And, and Rafi had said that very, very clearly um, based on, on what they like, because the truth is it, it really tries to strengthen company culture. We're, we're trying to serve our employees because in the end of the day, they serve us. It's a give and take relationship. And so the reason why it's important for us is because of just that it, it would build and strengthen workplace culture. It would increase retention. It, you would make, you would become a more desirable workplace. People would continue to come to you every day. Otherwise, what, what else would keep them there? And these are the kind of things that would help us better understand our, our demographics. 
Um, what do they value? You know, um, how can you retain their staff? What, so I think those are kind of one of the reasons why it's important for us to, to focus um, on personalization and how it really ties into our work. I, you know, I was thinking about that um, because I know with Disney, I'll just use them. Um, one of the things that they were talking about their success is really studying the demographics of the people who come to their visitors, right? That's why they're so successful because they put a lot of work in studying the demographics of their guests. So how much more in the workplace, right? Yeah. To this point of studying, studying the trends and what they like and their desires and their expectations. Anybody else want to on a build on, on that about, you know, why is it important to leaders before I go to Jen? Anybody else have thoughts on that? I would just like to say, I think as she's talking about that individualism, it is showing up also in an authentic way. Uh, I think uh, it was Rafi who said that, you know, slapping or, or slapping something on a birthday email is no longer, uh, or one of you said that it was wonderful because that's true. Like just saying happy birthday is no longer what our employees are looking for. They want a genuine experience where they're seen. And I really think that that's, you know, what we're talking about today, taking that data to the next level to really see and share that experience with our employees. So just wonderful. Thank you. Uh, that, and I think, Carrie, that's good. We're going to go to Jen. And I'd like to even say there's a balance there because some people simply want a happy birthday. So you got to think about that, right? Everybody doesn't want the high, the high and the glamour. So, and then some people don't even want you to say happy birthday. They just want to come to work and leave, right? And so when you start talking about this hyper personalization, it's important. And I know we're going to talk about that, that we make sure that it doesn't become a one size fits all. It's it's the it's this peripheral, it's the whole gamut. Love that. You know, Jen, jump into this. Based on what I just said, what are the top challenges related to applying data to create more personalized employee experience? And I kind of gave you an entree. You just remember, but what are some of the challenges you're seeing? Or you think are there? I mean, it's it's the data itself. Like we collect so much data in everything that we do. Um, and I think one of the challenges is don't collect data if you're not going to do anything with it. Because to the point we made earlier, people are going to stop giving it. Because like, I know you're not going to get my birthday right. I know you're not going to get my name right. I know you're not going to acknowledge that you are going to respect my preferences. So don't ask for it. Um, but I think one of my biggest challenges, particularly is, again, as I mentioned, I'm not embedded in HR. I'm in, I, I work with my HR partners, so I'm not. I don't have direct access to a lot of the data that I need to use to get personalization right for my organization. So part of it is you first have to know what data is available or is being collected before you know what you have to work with. You have to know where that data sits and how to get access to it. Um, you know, is it in a single repository, single source of truth, not scattered across multiple systems that are going to make it more likely that one system's going to get updated with one piece of data and another one's not? Um, has it been collected in or in an organic manner? Again, to Carrie's point, with that spirit of authenticity of intent, like not collecting it just to check a box, just to fill a bucket, just to say we've got this data um, and fulfill those activities. I think the other thing that that I struggle with is trusting that the data that I'm being given is current and accurate, which means we have to constantly be validating and like working on data hygiene to make sure things are updated. You know, particularly in big big businesses, people leave, join, move different, you know, to different areas all the time. So we need to make sure that our data is keeping up with the pace of change. Um, and you have to know the nuances of your business. So Again, one of my other big challenges here is highly matrixed organizations. You have to know the organization that you're in or that you are supporting or that you are working with to know where those dotted line relationships exist and how they connect so that you can make sure your data sets include everybody. I've got two big groups that I work with and one is consistently not tied to the other. If I didn't know that, those people would get overlooked. So. Um, you know, I think that's critical and, and doing all of that in a timely manner, because you don't want to get that birthday email six months later, because that's how long it took you right. to get the information. <laughs> so, um, so those are kind of all of all of my my challenges. And it's, it's like the love hate relationship with data. Yeah. I love that it's there. And it's great. But the struggle to get it and to use it effectively is, you know, it, it goes on. So, Jen, great, great conversation. Let me throw something out here for the panel. And, and it's really about this data. Um, I'm working with a client who's in this space. And one of the things that they're experiencing is that the employees are really, they're apprehensive. 
you know, they already don't have a trust for HR. They're apprehensive. And they're feeling like, here's another, HR is going to say that they're going to use this to personalize and they're going to care for me. Well, this is another way that I am going to be penalized. And so how would you, and just kind of someone jump in, advise a, an organization to, that is, wants to take this approach, that wants to start securing this data, knowing that in the back of people's minds, they still have an apprehension about HR's human resources um, offerings to them. How, how would you advise them to start? I think it's a good question on this data, talking about those challenges. Anybody? just. I'd like to add something to that. Um, yes. For our experience, I'll give you an example. So um, if you want to collect like EO information or DEI information specifically, you know, we use Workday, right, as an HRS system, mm -hmm. and we encourage our staff. There's a lot of optional things. We don't we don't pressure anyone to, uh, to add their, their gender or their race, you know, or their statuses. But it would greatly help HR if you did, right? And some people don't understand that. They don't know why. Well, well what would you use this data for? Um, but really, it relates to our perks, our benefits, the way that we interact with you to understand what you need. Um, and I think, again, like you had said, Stacey, they're absolutely apprehensive because perhaps in the past, providing that information, they felt they were discriminated or retaliated in some sense. Mm -hmm. They also are dealing with trauma, what I would say, uh, pre-pandemic ways of, of very old um, kind of paradigms of HR, maybe Correct. from previous employers, Correct. right? And so they go to the next uh, company and they think all HR is the same. And, and I can't blame them for that. All we have to do is try to correct that and to build their trust back. So uh, the way that we would use it, the way we would advise, you know, as a business partner to our company is to actually see change right away. So the way that we are approaching it is we have employee resource groups they are for underrepresented staff. And, you know, we have groups for LGBTQ community, people who are veterans, they're caregivers, they are women, um, they have disabilities, mental health issues, all sorts of things. We have all sorts of groups and we give them, a, you know, a voice and power. They, they also coordinate and liaise with an executive sponsor that we pair them up with. And so they have direct access to our executive teams to talk about some uh, you know, concerns that they have, if they have uh, feedback or any suggestions about things that directly um, impact them. And then we could make real and live changes, meaningful changes in the workplace. And so that is one way that we build trust back. And then they go, now I understand why they're asking for this data. It's because it's relating to the perks and benefits that they've just asked us. And so we give them an advocate and a group um, to kind of help them with that. So that's one of the ways that we tackle that. Francesca, that's amazing. Some immediate results, right? Some immediate results and utilizing your internal organization resource. Sometimes as, as, as people, business culture strategists, we don't utilize those resources internally. Those ERG groups are amazing. And thank you for saying that. That's why my company is called HR Interrupted for all of this, right? That next level of what we're doing. Thank you. Um, anybody else on that? Or I can jump into, um, Francesca, you have this, but Carrie, anyone jump in. What are some of the recent strategy gaps that HR leaders face in building that better employee experience that you were kind of talking about, Francesca, and I know it's gonna start with you. Um, that encourages career development. So what are some of the recent strategy gaps that HR leaders face in building better experiences that encourage career development and how can we overcome this? Maybe Francesca, you can start and Carrie, Jen and Rafi can jump in. Yes, absolutely. I think um, perhaps if you're looking at, you know, departments or, or HR leaders that are not really focusing on that next level career pathing development, there's very traditional mid-year reviews your, your annual reviews and that's it. And, and feedback, as you know, cannot just be twice a year. Um, and also in an empty open forum where there's no goal setting, there's there's no review, right? Um, there's no instant loop of feedback. And I think with that old paradigm, uh, there is no growth. And so the way that we're tackling it in our company is of course, I think the best thing, it's a standard I think of, as of today is to really have framework for job architecture and to understand where one position goes to the next. Mm -hmm. And that all ties also to pay banding, career pathing, job leveling. It's a whole framework, you know, and I know it's very intimidating to build it yourself. None of us are experts. I would highly encourage you to hire a third party, you know, consultant. We work with people like Mercer, who's absolutely incredible to help build us this framework. They help customize it for us. We have very unique positions in our company because we make a video game. So we have people like a vehicle artist. You're going to ask yourself, well, what is that? Um, this is in the digital space. We we make a, a computer game that's like in the universe. So uh, we have we build planetary systems and spaceships and we have specific people that are artists but build vehicles and they even build ships like I'm talking about spaceships and you go well 
what does my career pathing look like for someone who is a vehicle artist? They go to one, two, three, they'll be a lead vehicle artist, a senior vehicle artist. Do you want them to go to the manager path? Do they like to manage people? Or do they want to go to the principal path because they'd like to be an individual contributor? And that's how you really try to draw out a, a job architecture framework. So that's, I think, number one. And the two is having very customized uh, reviews. So not asking your standard uh, questions, of course, but really tailoring it to their uh, to their craft. So what we do is we have customized competencies that we do specifically for that. And we work and partner with each manager and then we uh, we give it out. So that that's actually something that we're currently working on at the moment. Francesca, do you that the job architect, do you introduce that pre-hire? Like do applicants know that that framework exists? Or do you just do they are they aware of their career path once they become an employee? Because what an amazing marketing idea for somebody who's an applicant who can already see, wow, this will keep in my structure. When is that when is that typically shared? I think it depends on the individual. You know, when you do interviews with people, that's when you really kind of figure out what their values are, the questions that they're asking, and also, you know, give and take the things that we're sharing to let them know, hey, if you would like to join our team, if you'd like to join our company, um, this is what it would look like. We'd also give them examples of career pathing success stories in our company. We have plenty of those. I've been in the company for 10 years. I started as an HR manager uh, in 2014. Right now, I'm the VP of HR for both US studios. And it's absolutely incredible. I, I'm just one example of many other employees that have kind of done the same. Perfect. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts about gaps? Well, I, I'd like to add on that. Uh, we too look at you know the jobs and the vertical but what we've really uh, started to do the last few years especially after covid is realize that the skill set is transferable so instead of just looking at vertical opening it up across the realm if maybe you don't want to stay in hr perhaps you're more interested in operations and there is a place that you can use that skill set and we can teach and train you uh, on the operations but that skill set of how you interact with people would be wonderful for an operations manager and as the business pivots our employees pivot, um, there's a lot of change and to be agile in those moments to allow that flexibility um, has been very successful for us um, to look outside verticals and to expand it further. And I think that goes directly back to the job architecture as you're talking, because you see those competencies in other areas and how it can all connect in the end. I love that. All right, Jen, this is for you. Can you share any examples? I mean, because we've kind of built this up and I, I'm just loving the way this conversation is going. Can you share any examples of innovation when soliciting and applying employee feedback to improve the employee's experience? Any examples? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I think one of the things we, we've we kind of skirted around when we've talked about tech and innovation is, you know, the use of, of AI and, and ML, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. Um, and it's usually when companies do that, they're thinking more about their external client relationships and how do we use that to make those better. I'm trying to use that technology to look inward and evaluate the employee sentiments and the feedback that we collect. Um, so that we can not only say, okay, you spoke, but we can say, this is what we're doing with it in response more quickly. And this is where I'm really hoping to kind of gain a little bit more traction. Um, you know, humans by definition come with bias. Like everything we do, we put our own filter on it, we put our own lens on it. And when we're looking at what employees have to say, we're inherently applying our own biases to the value of that feedback. So, you know, for example, if we think about um, and we try to figure and attribute, oh, well, Stace, that's got to be Stacy's comment or that's got to be Francesca's comment. You know, we can automatically say, oh, it doesn't matter. They're, they're bitter. They're disgruntled. They've got a chip on their shoulder. Let's just take that out of the equation and focus on everything else. Way too easy for humans to do that. So um, I know in our company, Francesca, you manage, you know, twice year reviews and things like that. We survey our employees all the time. We just wrapped up our annual employee survey. So it's like my Super Bowl season. I'm, I'm waiting for that feedback to come back. Um, and we do ad hoc surveys all the time. We have a recurring listening strategy to gather sentiments on varieties of topics and small group formats. And, and in an organization of 300,000 employees globally, you can imagine how much feedback we have to read through. And that's literally reading through it. So I'm trying to get work with our tech teams to apply AI ML models to that so that we can review that verbatim feedback 
more quickly, more efficiently, and without bias so that we can really get to what are the trends that, um, you know, we can work with and, and have to respond to more quickly. You know, it kind of gets to what we've already touched on, too, about, you know, that technology is the technology we have to think about how is that going to impact what we do tomorrow. So I'm also really hyper focused on how does using things like this impact the workforce of the future to say, you know what, and it's like, you're not going to lose your job, but your job is going to change and you have to be agile and prepared for that. Here's how your transferable skills fit into other job families. We have similar structures. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really great to hear that, like, we're aligned with some of the mm -hmm. things that we're, we're doing at a global level, because that's really when you look at what the generations of tomorrow that are coming into the workplace today are going to look for it. They're going to expect that and they're going to to want that. So we have to be prepared for that and get people who like AMI, AIML isn't isn't scary. It's going to help augment and make you better. I think I, I so appreciate that, right? That is the next era workforce coming in. And how do you, you know, how do you continue to move that forward? How do you sell that? And still going back to understanding that there are people who are going to be apprehensive and not that we don't want to bring them along, but it's the way that the organization communicates it. Right. And I think that when you start looking at that personalization, as I said earlier, you know, how do you communicate that? So um, one more question and then I want to we'll go to the Q&A. Uh, Rafi, <laughs> you tell what's next in employee experience, any techs or trends? I know um, Jen talked about machine learning, AI, but What's next in the employee experience? Any tech trends that you see are game changers? Yeah, there's quite a few that I know Google is definitely working on right now. Obviously, everybody knows about Gemini and things like that. And I'll talk about that here a little bit too. But uh, a couple of interesting ones that I want to highlight is, um, you know, people analytics. So like, you know, we're not just collecting data on employees anymore. We're actually using it to like understand what makes people tick, like, you know, basically people analytics combines uh, power of like big data, machine learning, behavioral sciences. We kind of put it all together to basically, you know, talk about like focus on employee engagement and productivity. Like how do we get these people to be more productive? You know, how do we how do we encouraging, you know, encourage people to to really engage? So think of it like um, the way I think about it is imagine like a dashboard that tells you like which of your employees are about to have a burnout which teams are collaborating more like most effectively, um, you know, where there's maybe some learning opportunities and each employee that, that they want. Right. So this kind of thing, I think, is becoming definitely a big thing with AI. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is um, like just uh, personalized like coaches. So like these chatbots are becoming much of more of a thing and they have the ability to, you know, they use neural networks so they can kind of learn. Uh, they use, I guess, a combination of neural networks and also machine learning. So basically, whatever you tell it, it's going to memorize, right? It's going to remember that it has that kind of capability. And Google has so many different data points about us. So I think that's kind of a big thing is just kind of like, um, you know, these AI chatbots kind of take going through, like starting with you when you start your job and taking you through the entire journey, like suggesting relevant projects maybe you can apply for or be involved with, helping you prepare for your next performance reviews and things like that. Um, it can even help you like, you know, tailor your benefits package, recommend different types of wellness programs that some employee might be interested in based on what they've shown that they're interested in. So that's one big trend. The other one I've seen is kind of like, um, I don't know what to call it, but think of it like a virtual, like a workplace type of thing where like, you know, there's like different types of like, um, imagine like virtual offices, remote offices where teams can collaborate together, kind of like Zoom meetings. That's, that's a good example. Um, in real time and like being able to attend different types of sessions, uh, socialize within those virtual offices, virtual break rooms, you know, and if, especially like there's so much remote work right now. So just kind of having like a virtual workplace where you can literally walk to different types of virtual rooms. I think that's something really interesting that I think a lot of companies are starting to look into. Um, there's obviously like the, the listening aspect of it with AI. So, you know, like Traditionally, like we've always been sending out like surveys, focus groups, and those kind of things, but like um, nowadays, it's more like just AI, you know, chatting with you and kind of understanding like, you know, what's your sentiments on different types of things that are going on within the company, um, you know, um, like gathering anonymous feedback from different employees, 
um you know just basically kind of like bringing it all together but just kind of taking a lot more a lot more like conversational approach to it and the other thing i would say is definitely on the, like in terms of like the training um i know i personally use gemini to learn all different types of skill sets that i think it would be very technical and hard to understand just and and also be able to find a mentor that can teach me that right on, on, on my fingertips but i have that with gemini i can literally upload tons of documents into it and it's integrated with my google drive and everything so you can pull documents for me analyze emails for me and then give me a comprehensive review of what it is and also i've been using the hint prompt assertion method so it won't take me to the next concept until it knows i know that concept because i have to give it back a certain part of the response before it'll move me to the next step so using that kind of hint prompt assertion method i mean you can think of like just imagine what this means for employee training right like right now if you pair me up with a with an employee a trainer the trainer might explain a concept and say hey rafi do you understand this and i'll just nod and say yes i get it and the trainer and the the, the, the tutor will just move on but these AI bots, if you if you give it the prompt that, hey, don't move to the next step until the, the student is able to give that level back to you, it's going to be a much better tutor because it's not going to move me to the next concept. So I think these are some of the coolest trends that are coming up that I found wow. really. Rafi, this is I mean, this is this is next level, you guys. Like, thank you. Thank you so much. And in, in the people, business, culture and strategy space, we're, we're ever changing. I love what, you know, Jennifer said about, you know, the next era leaders coming in and Rafi, you're talking about, you know, the, 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 the chatbot training and, and Francesca talking about that framework architecture and care. I mean, this is the next level. I'm so excited. We have some questions. We have uh, Vicky, first of all, panel, thank you. Stay around. We're going to answer some of these questions and I'll get some last comments from you. Vicky, you want to hit us in the, in the, with the questions from the audience, I think quite a few are coming in, huh? They sure are, Stacey. Thank you all for this. This has been a fabulous conversation. Um, re reminder, audience members, you can still enter questions, and we are now going to review a few of the questions that we have time for that came in. The first question that came in was, is there a concern that hyper-personalization might create an uneven playing field where some employees benefit more than others, and how do we ensure fairness? That's a great question. Who would like to take that? Francesca, I was gonna. Oh, so, go oh, ahead. Sorry. Let's go, Carrie. Yeah, Jean. I was. I think. It, go ahead. Go you ahead, bet. Go. I think we're all like, this is great because you know it. It also, I think, piggybacks nicely off of some of the things that Rafi was saying. I think there's there's two eye two sides to that sword. Is yeah, a lot of data is great, but to some of these questions that we're seeing about how's it going to be used, what about privacy, mm -hmm. what about you like equal opportunity and everybody having access to that? That's part of what I deal with on the on the flip side in an operation space. We've got five generations in the workplace right now, and I can tell you we get five hundred different responses on like how people how comfortable people are with that data you know so the younger generations have grown it up in this era of everything they do and say being tracked we've got older generations are like what's the smartphone and why does it know that i just looked for something about cats and now everything i get is about cats mm -hmm. and so i think you have to be willing to balance and have multi-channel solutions and lots of different options right now to collect data and manage that data based on those generational preferences, because there are some people who are going to be really freaked out by anything that's hyper personalized, because they're going to be like, where's the camera? Where's the microphone? Like, who heard me? You know, think that. And there are other generations that have just come to expect it. So I think it's you have to you have to balance out those expectations. You have to have a variety of, of different solutions um, and keep those kind of all, you know, in your scope like do, does everybody have access to the same tools to the same resources you know do they have the bandwidth do they have a smartphone like those are things that we deal with every day when we try to make our apps and the things that we work with more mobile and you know let's face it we have some people that that don't have the data plans they need to support things like zoom they don't have you know the access that they need to get to the data or they're just not comfortable and and being like i'm not going to tell you what my preferences are because i just don't trust it yet that's true carrie you want to jump on that great that's a great call in jen great call in carrie yes so kind of piggybacking on that 
technology is working faster than the law. The EEOC just recently came out with some articles in regards to adverse impacts, specifically with the AI tool being used as we, you know, vet out all the applicants that are coming in for our jobs. And then I think what that means is that as an organization, whether you're in HR or whatever you do, you have a higher level of responsibility to assure, like Jen said, we all have biases. How are we assuring that we know when, where that is happening so we can you know, turn it around and make sure that it doesn't happen as we continue? We have to continue to audit and look at that data and what's coming in compared to the gamut. And as Jen said, it's a lot, it's a lot of data. So it'll be interesting, but it'll be interesting to see the laws that are coming around this as we do continue to collect more to make better experiences for our employees. Outstanding, great. Melissa, I mean, Melissa, Vicki, any other questions? A lot of great questions. Yeah, some questions? very good ones. One of them that you kind of addressed a little bit in that last, those last answers, this is about data privacy, right? So data privacy is a big concern. How will employee data be collected and used for hyper-personalization? And will employees have control over the data? You want to take that, Francesca, Rafi? You want? We can take data privacy offline. <laughs> take data privacy <laughs> offline. <laughs> Well, I, it's like one of the points that I made earlier, and again, working outside of HR, I can say that our HR groups are very stringent about protecting that data, not disclosing that data. Like, I pretty much have to write a short thesis on why I want the data, how I'm going to use it, what I'm going to do with it um, to even get access to it. So I think, again, piggybacking off what Carrie said, it's a matter of companies keeping up with with the laws and understanding you know, how it's going to be used, what they can do, EEOC and, and, and all of those things. Um, you know, there's also a judgment recently about you know, affirmative action and can you do targeted programs and, you know, using data again, we talked about preferences and people self IDing and self disclosing, you know, it's, it's what can you do with that data if you're collecting it and how do you ensure that you're using it um, in the right way and, and not abusing it. So I think, I think these are questions, at least I know from a business perspective, I'm being challenged to ask all the time and, and working with my HR partners as well to understand you know, this is this is why we need it from a, a practical perspective. Again, to get people to trust, you know, what we're doing with it. Like, it's one thing to collect it if you don't ever show what you're doing with it, and people don't trust that you're using that data in you know a way that benefits them. Yeah. They're going to stop giving it. So, yeah. to, oh, go ahead, Rafi. No, I was just going to add. A lot of this actually falls on your cybersecurity professionals as well, because they're the ones that are in charge of your identity and access management, right? So their job is to make sure that the right people have access to the right data and resources at the right time for the right reason. So if you don't have any kind of really good system in place, if you don't have something set up through SailPoint, Okta, some technology like that, I mean, like if you're just kind of winging it like on spreadsheets and stuff like that, then there's a good chance that the data is not going to go where you want it to go and it's going to go somewhere where you don't want it to go. So I think just having a really good, you know, identity access management protocols, you know, making sure that you have role-based access control, those kind of features are in place and there's consistent reviews, right? Like just doing those reviews, making sure that people have the right access at a given, given time. I think one of the uh, speakers earlier mentioned the joiners, movers, and leavers uh, concept, right? So you want to make sure that anytime someone comes in, someone moves, someone leaves, that uh, access is updated and that they no longer have access to things that they don't need. And I think doing that and just having the good, best practices there not only keeps you compliant for different types of compliance related things, but also just keeps, you know, employee data or even customer data protected, I think. Outstanding. Vicki, a lot of questions. Yeah, I see two questions related to surveys. So I'm going to kind of put them together a bit. Um, any advice on personalizing employee or organization wide surveys to elicit better feedback? What questions have you found that are best questions to really get employees to open up and engage? And the other question about surveys is, well, we find that even anonymous surveys don't get much participation. And what are good ways to get employees to provide that feedback? I'd like to just jump in. It's honestly, it's really hard. There's, it's no black and white when you talk about surveys. It's very hard. There's no perfect one answer to do that. Again, 
collecting the data and asking people, please complete the survey after they have meetings all day and they go, well, what's this for? How is this going to benefit me? What are you going to do with this information? Like, again, a lot of us in this call have mentioned um, trust, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think I would say the what things that we've tried at least are, you know, different types of formats. Do you have a Likert scale? Do you have, like a, do you have an open form where they can just type away? People, you know, is it going to be paragraphs worth? Is it worth it to read this thing? If, if you have a thousand staff to 10,000 staff, how are you going to actually um, put that data together, right, in a meaningful fashion where you could pull out information and go, okay, it looks like X percent want this or X percent want that. I don't think there is... Um, a hard and fast answer that there's one answer. You have to try them all and you have to see what data you get. And then you have to work with your analysts and really try to pull meaningful information to see if you can make change. And so, um, you know, we sent all, all types of surveys out. I know that, uh, Jen, as well, it's very important to collect that survey. You were just talking about surveys that you sent out, do things like poll surveys, engagement surveys, benefit surveys. We even do things like post-mortem surveys of, did you like their summer party? Did you like the offerings that we gave? We look at usage, like, how many people like the beers to the Coke to the to the water? You know, um, we want to make sure that we're investing. When you come to the office with your free snacks and stuff, is this what you actually want? Um, is anybody consuming this? Are we wasting money on this? There, these are just examples of like uh, how you would collect this data. But again, this uh, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. I'd love to um, open it to the floor and see you know what's worked for you. Yeah. We, I think I think all of above, like Francesca, you said the, the five letters I was going to say, T-R-U-S-T. You have to show people if you're asking for their feedback and asking for their sentiments that you heard them and what are you doing about it or what have you done? You have to be able to close that loop. Otherwise, they're going to be like, I told Francesca a hundred times I prefer Diet Coke over Diet Pepsi and they still give me Diet Coke so or Diet Pepsi. So I'm done. I'm not responding to any survey. So and like that only comes with with overtime. And it, you know, it's a continual process of, you know, what surveys work for what audiences and in what circumstances. And yeah, there is there is no one magic bullet. If anybody has found that, please. <laughs> we all need it. <laughs> I like the conversation though about really making sure we do something with the data. I mean, it's just very that it's that simple. If we are collecting it, and I love your example, I don't like Diet Coke, I like Diet Pepsi. Why did you send me a year supply of Diet Coke? Right. And you feel well intended. And then when I respond the way, then I'm a problem employee. No, 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 no. Right. So I love that intentionality really that intentionality around what we're doing with the data. I think we have time for one more question, uh, Vicki. Yeah, we sure do, but we'll make it fast. We have three minutes. Um, so this is good because that all you've brought up all these wonderful processes for hyper-personalization. And this question is, how can we measure the success of hyper-personalization efforts? Are there any key metrics we should be tracking? That's a great question. I mean, if you have... Um, follow-up surveys of what do you think of this and that and and I guess you know any positive feedback that's one way to do it a lot of it I would even think is organic feedback direct feedback mm -hmm. um, my my manager always tells me anytime that someone gives you positive feedback share that with me and so I just actually did that uh, 10 minutes ago I did a screenshot of someone goes I'm, they're watching it now like oh I loved how you, I'm watching you in Argyle and I did copy and paste and said there you go um, and so those are the kind of things you know hey I just want to let you know that Francesca really helped me here with, I don't know, this relocation, this moving, this helping me with my team. Um, those are the kind of direct feedback that I think, you know, you've touched upon one or two, three lives, and that was good enough. That that was direct from the source. That's one way. That's a very genuine, a very authentic way. Another way, of course, are the, are the surveys. That's at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. That's good feedback. Anyone else? I think it also goes to how are you, how are you filtering your data? So like, do you, like, we've got all this data. So what are the trends that you're observing by generation, by location, by pay grade level, by, you know, role level? I think, you know, is it, are you interested in retention? Are you interested in development? Are you interested in career progression? So I think part of that is you have to know, again, what is your goal with all of the data that you're collecting to determine whether or not you're successful or ask your employees like, hey, are we getting it right? Like, or what are we missing? And it's, it, it's that continual cycle of ask, 
Ask and answer. <laughs> you guys, this has been an amazing, amazing panel. Francisca, Jen, Carrie, and Rafi, thank you so very much. I'm going to throw us back to Vicki. Thank you all for such an insightful panel discussion. What a wonderful group we have today. I also want to thank everyone else for joining us for this session. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand for the following uh, week. And for have earned points throughout today's uh, event. And our Gal team member will be following up with winners in the next couple of weeks. Um, this does officially conclude the Argyle HR Leadership Forum. Thank you again for joining us today and engaging in our content. We look forward to seeing you at our next Argyle Digital HR event soon, which will be our HR Leadership Forum, HR Innovation for Growth, on December 5th, 2024. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you again for being here.